Hello and welcome to Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. In this lecture we'll answer the question, how has paleontology revolutionized the study of evolution? This lecture is divided into two parts. First we'll look at what is evolution and the history of its study. And then we'll discuss what evolutionary questions paleontology has addressed that has given us a greater understanding of evolution. Prior to the early 1800s, most scientists viewed organisms as unchanging and always present on the planet. Extinction was not viewed as possible and most scientists viewed life as static. The fossil record is pretty poor. However, in the early 1800s with the Industrial Revolution, new fossils were being discovered from coal mines and the exploration of the world was starting to fill the first natural history museums with strange natural history objects like fossils. One of the early workers who studied the anatomy of these new fossils was the infamous Dr. Richard Owen, a professor of surgery who noticed similarities between organisms. Organisms appeared to follow certain plans in their anatomy. And this figure here is from his 1849 book on the nature of limbs. He noticed that vertebrate animals share many similar traits. They all have a series of backbones, they have two sets of limbs, and even had the same set of bones in the distal limbs, the hands and the feet. And this idea was not new, and many of the scientists viewed life as falling into hierarchical arrangements of similarities. But Owen took the idea a little further when he proposed an archetype. An archetype, or ball plan, is the shared characteristics of a group of similarly related organisms. By proposing such an idea, Owen, as well as some of his contemporaries, begin to document these similarities between organisms and suggesting some sort of relationship. One of the earliest people to invoke the idea that species change was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Lamarck was of importance in this course because he coined the term invertebrate. Lamarck started out as a botanist studying plants at the poorly funded Paris Botanical Gardens as an unpaid student, working part-time as a clerk, spending much of his time as he could on describing plants. In 1793, Louis the 16th and Mary Antoinette were executed and the new post-revolutionary French government went into engaged citizens with science and as such helped form the Musée National de History Naturelle, Natural History Museum and Natural History in Paris. Lamarck was appointed to the curator of insects and worms. And despite not knowing much about insects and worms, Lamarck became fascinated with them and coined the term invertebrate, to contrast from vertebrates, as illustrated previously by Owen. Lamarck was, at the time, a student of everything, and he came to recognize great things, such that all life is composed of individual cells. He also helped divide in invertebrates into the groups that we'll be studying in the coming lectures. But he also, in 1809, proposed that species, particular animals, could change over time. This was, as he stated, as follows. All acquisitions, or losses, wrought by nature on individuals through the influence of the environment in which the race has long been placed, and hence through the influence of the predominant use of permanent or permanent disuse of any organ, all of these are preserved by the reproduction to new individuals which arise, provided that the acquired modifications are common to both sexes, or at least to the individuals which produce the young. Now the common example that's invoked in how Lamarck viewed evolution is the giraffe. Lamarck viewed the influence of the environment would extend to the giraffe's neck and it would cause it to reach for higher and taller trees and that this acquired inheritance was then passed on to the offspring. Hence often his idea is called acquired inheritance. Perhaps more important was Lamarck's visionary idea of adaptation, that organisms have characteristics that help them function in the environment that they live within. At the end of Lamarck's life, he became blind, and that's when this portrait was made of him. Sadly, he died 30 years before Charles Darwin published his Origin of Species. Every introductory biology course goes into detail about the work of Charles Darwin, 
And although Darwin collected fossils on his journey around the world, his fossils were given over to the British Museum and expertly described by Richard Owen. Hence, fossils did not occupy a major portion of the book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. In fact, Darwin lamented the poor state of the fossil record, and much more of the book was detailing the discussion of artificial selection, or selective breeding. Much of our Darwin's ideas came from his passion to raise different domestic animals and plants and breeding them for desirable traits. What Darwin wondered is if this selective breeding was occurring naturally, for example in the finches he collected in the Galapagos Islands. And this is his idea of natural selection. Darwin's theory of natural selection can be broken into five key ideas. Animals reproduce faster than needed. There's a struggle for existence and resources. Each individual is different, and there's variation in the population. Traits are inherited from parents, and the best fit for the environment are the ones that survive, or as everybody calls it, survival of the fittest. Darwin, however, had a big problem with his theory. If traits are inherited equally, then eventually all organisms will contain similar traits and variability will decrease. This is referred to as blended inheritance. Blended inheritance is what happens when you mix colors together. If you have two individual organisms and they mate, and the resulting offspring exhibit a blend of characters from both parents, as each generation is born, the variation of the colors will decrease until all individuals will look the same. They would all be black in color. There had to be a way to introduce new variation within the population. Where did this variation of traits in a population come from? Ideas were wild and crazy from uh, mutations such as the hopeful monster hypothesis of Goldsmith in the early 1900s to the idea of spontaneous variation arising from mutations that could arise during the lifespan of an organism or maybe there's a modified Lamarck idea where certain traits or characteristics could be somehow passed on uh, once they're gained in the parents. Now the solution to Darwin's problem lay in a le letter that was sent to him, but he never opened it, and it was never opened until after he died. We refer to what's in this letter as neodarism, which is a new idea that addressed particularly this problem of variation and inheritance. The letter was from an Augustine friar named Gregor Mendel from what is today the Czech Republic. Mendel is known as the father of genetics, discovered while growing peas at a monastery that inheritance was not blended but followed a probability distribution. It's much like a game of cards. In a game of cards the characteristic of each played hand can differ fundamentally by the interaction of the handful of cards in play to make uh, millions or trillions of different arrangements. Mendel realized that the same reshuffling of characters were happening, happening with his peas. By keeping notes on which peas he bred and each generation's expression of those traits, he realized that many characters followed a simple probability distribution. Often a single dominant expression trumps other less dominant expressions. For example, let's imagine a very simple card game in which there are two types of cards that are dealt. These cards can either be an ace or a king. The first random hand has a king and an ace. Another random hand could have uh, two kings. The hand with the different cards we can call heterozygous, while the hand with the same cards, a pair, we call homozygous. There are two other possible hands in our game. Uh, one with a paired uh, aces, and the other with an ace in the first card and a king in the second card. Both a homozygous, because it's a pair, and a heterozygous, because they're different. Note that if inheritance follows this randomness, variation will be maintained, but on average, 25% of the hands will have two aces. This could code for a particular characteristic, like peapod color, for example. In Mendelian genetics, a Putnam square is used to explain the simple, simplest card game, in which you have two types of cards. In this case, we have a big R and a little r. The big R is the dominant character, and it will express itself whenever it's played in the offspring. The little r is recessive and only expresses itself in the absence of the big R. 
If the big R codes for a red color and the little r codes for an expression of blue color, the probability that an offspring has a blue color is only 25%. The discovery Mendel made was that sexually reproducing organisms have paired chromosomes. These chromosomes split with one side originating from the mother and the other side originating from the father. Every cell has a copy of the chromosomes in the nucleus, and chromosomes are made up of DNA molecules. Let's quickly define some key terms. A genome is the whole genetic complex, like all the chromosomes together. A gene is the parts of the chromosome that code for certain traits. When chromosomes are paired, we call that a diploid. And when chromosomes are unpaired, we call that a haploid. A polypoid, or polypoidally, are where you have multiple sets of chromosomes. This rarely happens in animals, but it's very common in plants, and we'll talk more about that later on. An allele is where you have one, two, or more forms of a gene or genetic locus on a chromosome. A phenotype is the organism's observable characteristics or traits that are coded for by that allele. In paleontology, we can refer to fossils phenotype, the expression of the trait, but never the gene, allele, or genome, which are not preserved. Each chromosome is made of dioxyribonucleic acid, a single complex string of four, four base pairs, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. DNA serves as the blueprint for RNA. RNA is like a Xerox copy of the DNA strand and is sent into the cell from the nucleus where amino acids form complex proteins along the surface of the RNA. These proteins facilitate the growth and function within the cell. There are two types of cell division that can happen. The first is mitosis. Mitosis is where you have a daughter that's a daughter cell that's nearly identical to the parent cell. This is what happens in asexually reproducing organisms. The chromosomes remain the same. It, all, it also happens in all multicellular organisms with cell division within a single individual. Many bacteria exhibit this type of reproduction as well, although there's a significant advantage to sexual reproduction because it quickly mixes variation across a population and can speed up the reaction to natural selection. The second type of cell division is meiosis. This is, meiosis is where you have produced cells with one copy of the genetic material. Meiosis produces what are called gametes. These are the sperm and eggs. Throughout the semester, we'll be talking about gametes in which many invertebrate groups and plants can exhibit their own life within a complex life cycle. In most animals and plants, these are the reproductive cells, the sperm and the eggs. Gametes are haploid, which means they have one set of chromosomes. Recombination of two gametes form a unique cell or genotype, which have paired chromosomes. The probabilities of each outcome in a diploid chromosome can be expressed with a simple mathematical formula called the Hardy-Weinberg equation, where the P and Q are the allele frequencies for each trait. Hence, as organisms mate, Variation is maintained in the population, and hence, natural selection can work on this variation. Yay! Darwin's problem has been solved. Mutation is still a common way to introduce variation because every cell is replicated millions and trillions of times, leading to the introduction of errors. Random changes in the chemical makeup of the DNA helix, or even chromosome inversion, addition, deletion, or rearrangement, this is the source of new variation. So natural selection removes variation in the population, mutations introduce new variation, and sexual mating maintains variation in the population. What about fossils? All the study of evolution does not seem to involve paleontology. How did paleontology revolutionize the study of evolution? Paleontology did this in three major phases. First, paleontology validated the theory of evolution with numerous transitional fossils. After Darwin published The Origin of Species, the fossil record started to get much better. In 1849, only four species of dinosaurs were known, but by 1900, hundreds of dinosaurs were discovered, a complex bush of extinct creatures. The first published specimen of Archaeopteryx was only discovered two years later 
which meant that Darwin in later editions was able to comment about this discovery. In fact, Thomas H. Huxley's work on the origin of birds strongly vindicated Darwin's idea that organisms change through time. Early on, paleontology also showed that complexity increases over time in the fossil record. This validation of evolution is the strongest line of evidence for evolution. Lower, older stratigraphic units have less complex organisms, while younger, higher stratigraphic units contain more complex organisms. This is the foundation of geology, as well as a strongly, continually tested notion of evolution. Paleontology also provides evidence for the tempo and mode of evolution, or how fast or slow organisms change, and the style of those changes. These key questions were addressed viciously in the 1970s and 1980s. In the next lecture, we're going to explore evolutionary rates more closely but paleontology revolutionized our understanding of the rates of evolution and natural selection, the patterns of extinction and speciation, and the diversity of life through time, and the adaptation of organisms to a changing earth in its changing environment. The terms tempo and mode come from the classic book by the paleontologist G.G. Simpson, entitled Tempo and Mode in Evolution, published in 1944. G. G. Simpson was part of a group of evolutionary scientists who studied evolution from a multidisciplinary approach, which included paleontologists, geneticists, biologists, embryologists, and others that looked at evolution using different lines of evidence, but widely met and read each other's work. Now, sadly, paleontologists is not often included today in many discussions of evolutionary science, as molecular biologists have sort of monopolized the study of evolution using molecular approach. But key questions in evolution can only be answered using the fossil record. And these include, how fast is evolution? How do organisms adapt to changing environments? How common is extinction? What are the patterns of evolution through time? Hey, I want to talk quickly about something I didn't mention when we talked about ontogeny. And that is this term called heterochrony which means different time. Um, and the first example I'm going to use is called pedomorphism. Pedomorphism is where a juvenile character is retained in the adult. Um, and a good example of this is probably with tunicates. Um, we usually talk about tunicates in vertebrate paleontology, but tunicates are kind of interesting. They're a group of uh, organisms that have a larval stage that have a mobile tail that swim around in the water column. And then they find a suitable place, and they settle down, and they become a sessile organism living on the ocean floor. These are oftentimes called the sea squirts. And um, so what could happen is the larval stage, um, instead of settling down, it decides to become sexually mature. And that would be an example of pedomorphism. Another type of heterochrony is paramorphism. This is where the descendant adult is more advanced. Um, examples of this are the hypermorphism, or so delayed delaying the sexual maturity until much later. Also, the acceleration or increasing rate of a morphological growth, um, or the pre-displacement -displace uh, earlier onset of growth. So example of this would be maybe uh, looking at limb um, and having uh, the limbs repeated or fingers repeated more often. That would be a more derived trait, a more sort of Instead of stopping the growth, it continues the growth and lets it keep on going on. And that's an example of paramorphism. So I just wanted to define those two terms for you. So if you're interested in taking a geology class at Utah State University, check out the website geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in my research, check out my website benjamin Thank you for watching. Take care. Bye.